says that he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so we're going to develop this book through that lens, through that focal point, that we have a living hope. Now, first thing I want to talk about is Jesus is our living hope when we don't fit in. Have you ever felt like you didn't fit in? Maybe it was a company party. Uh, maybe it was in a family gathering. <clears throat> maybe it was, you, you name it, you know it, a neighborhood party, and you felt like you just don't fit in. And uh, all of us, I think, have experienced that at some point. We just don't fit in. As Christians, we find that probably more and more, the more closely we follow Jesus, the less we feel like we fit in to this world. Peter is the square peg trying to fit into the round mold, okay? The round hole. He, he's the square peg. His name is Peter. Now, that's not his birth name. His birth name is Simon. And uh, John the Baptist had two followers and among uh, all of his disciples that were following John the Baptist. One was Andrew and the other was John. And when Jesus was baptized and, and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, those two, John and Andrew, said, Hey, we're going to follow Him, the Messiah. And they leave John the Baptist and they go start following Jesus. And, and when, when Andrew realizes in his heart that he is the Messiah, he, Andrew goes and tells his brother. So it says, Andrew brought him, that is his brother, to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you were Simon. Okay, so somebody must have told you. <laughs> so you know my name. And then he says, you are Simon, the son of John. You know what we would say today? He's Simon Johnson, right? John, son, all right? He's Simon, the son of John, but you will be called Cephas. Now, Cephas is Aramaic. It's Aramaic. Aramaic is a sister language to Hebrew. And by the time of Christ, they're mostly speaking Aramaic and not Hebrew. And so the word Cephas means a stone, a stone. Which when translated is Peter. <laughs> All right, Petras, Petra. And so he translates it. So he's got this nickname given to him by Jesus. And Jesus calls him and identifies him and names him. And he says, no, you're no longer who you used to be. You see, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, when you're born again, when you, when you become a Christian, you are no longer who you used to be. So Cephas, uh, which was Simon, is Peter, and that's how we know him. He is Peter. He's called by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's an apostle. In fact, if you were looking at the Gospel of Mark, you would find that he, Jesus, appointed 12, designating them apostles. The word apostle means you are sent with a commission. I am commissioning you to go somewhere and represent me. And so he is one of the 12. He says that they might be with him. That's the first part. All the apostles were with Jesus. They spent time with Jesus and that they might, that he might send them out. That's what an apostle is. He sends them out as his representative to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. In the next verse, I didn't put it up here, but the next verse, they put the list of the 12 apostles and number one on the list is Peter. It's Peter. Cephas, for this guy Simon. His name occurs like 50 times or so in the Gospels, and it's, it's always uh, Peter or Simon Peter or Simon, and sometimes Cephas, but he is a main character, and he is the square peg. We know Peter because he's the guy who always jumps in doing like the wrong thing at the wrong time. And he's kind of like us, just a common, ordinary guy. He's a fisherman. In the book of Acts, he's called an ignorant and unlearned man, and yet he writes this letter the epistle. But ignorant and unlearned man just meant that uh, he didn't go to school. Uh, he wasn't trained in the, the, as the rabbis were. He's just a layman. That's what it meant. He's a layman. 
And Jesus calls just an ordinary, unusual, fisherman kind of guy, outspoken, jumps in when he shouldn't be jumping in. He picks him to be the apostle. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's sent with a commission. And and he's going to write about Jesus, our living hope, because we just don't fit in. He's the kind of guy that knows what it's like to not fit in. First thing he says, we don't fit in because we're strangers. I've looked around, and you've probably looked around too, and you probably think I'm strange, and I probably think you're strange, (laughs) but that's not what it means. He's writing, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world. Different. Really different. The early Christians, when they were being persecuted, they developed a little acronym, a little sign, that they could identify one another like in code. And I have it up on the screen. It was just to draw a fish. Two, like, half semicircles in such a way that became, it was called ichthus, ichthus, because that's what those Greek letters spell. And the word ichthus is fish, fish. But the acronym, Yesu, Christu, we, uh, Theu, we ask soter means Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Savior. Huh. So a Christian, uh, you see sometimes Christians will put this little bumper sticker on their car. It was started a long time ago in, in the first century when they're being persecuted. To, to find out, they would just draw a fish, take a stick and draw a fish in the sand. If the other one drew the fish, they knew that they were both believed in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, my Savior. Because they were strangers in this world. The the term literally is sojourners. Sojourners. Some translations actually render it sojourners. And a sojourner is a sojourner in a strange place. That's the full context of what the word means. And, And what it's really saying, Peter is saying, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We used to sing a song like that. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door because I just can't feel at home in this world anymore. And and, and we're, we're just strangers. We are not attached to this world. Jesus wasn't. What did he own? Did he own a home? No. Do you own a camel or a donkey? No. He had to borrow a donkey to ride into Jerusalem. Are you kidding me? Uh, Jesus was a stranger in the world that he had created. He came unto his own, his own received him not. What, he was a stranger here. He, he was sojourning, in fact, in the incarnation. The word for incarnation in, in the Gospel of John, the 14th verse is, and he tabernacled among us. He was a stranger. And that's the whole idea. He pitched his tent among us. This is so appropriate. It's Camper Sunday. (laughs) Campers go and they pitch a tent. You pitch a tent. It's a temporary dwelling. Okay? And it's in a strange place. Unless you go there every single year to pitch your tent. Right? But but a, a camper goes to a strange place. He pitches his tent and Peter is saying, listen, when you feel like a stranger, you're in a strange place, people think you're strange and alien because you're, that's what you are. That's what you are. Area 51, the youth took this name. Okay, They chose this name. Years ago, they chose the name. And the verse that goes with it is, uh, is that, such as in John 17, 16, it says, not of the world. Well, if you're not of the world, then you're an alien. And everybody knows that uh, Area 51 is where all the aliens are supposed to be. And so they played off of that, that as these aliens are here in the world, I too am an alien because I am not of the world. I have a home in heaven and I am just sojourning here. This world is not my home. See how it all fits together? Pitched our tents. 
The second thing, not only are we strangers in a strange place and we just feel like we don't fit into the world, he says we are scattered. Scattered throughout. And I've kind of listed these areas for you. Uh, the word scattered, though, means diaspora. That's the technical term. The diaspora goes all the way back to Bible times when the nation Israel was conquered by the Assyrians and they scattered them through the Assyrian Empire. And that term became used to be scattered outside your homeland. Isn't that what we are? If heaven is my home, we Christians on planet Earth are scattered. He says throughout Pontus. That's the region of Pontus in Asia Minor or what we would call the, the country of Turkey today. Pontus, Galatia. Galatia is where Apostle Paul spent quite a bit of time on his first and second missionary journey. He established churches there. And then we have Cappadocia. On his second missionary journey, he passed through there. And then he, it was also in Asia and Bithynia. The only one of these areas the Apostle Paul did not go in was Pontius. He actually went to all of those. On his second missionary journey, he went through Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia. He went up all the way around into, to, into Macedonia and Greece. And then he sailed across to Ephesus in Asia. The, 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 this was the, the beginning of the first century church, uh, headquarters, the place where it was thriving. And, and these are people of the Spora. They have been displaced. And I, he might be re writing to Hebrew Jewish people, uh, or, or Christian, Hebrew Christians, Jewish Christians, or he's just writing to everybody at large who had been scattered because of persecution in Jerusalem because they just didn't fit in. So they're scattered. They're scattered. I have found that almost anywhere I go, I will sooner or later in that area bump into a Christian. I'll bump into a Christian. I mean, I'm walking across uh, the Royal Gorge, you know, out in Colorado, the bridge. And halfway across, coming at me, is one of my seminary friends. Boom, we just bump into each other. Uh, it doesn't matter. I, I go to Florida. I run, we go to a church there. Uh, we're going across the United States, and, and we go to California, and I've been to famous churches, the Glass Cathedral. I've been where Chuck Swindoll preached. Uh, I, I've been to, no matter where I go. We're, we're in Utah, and uh, we're looking for a church. And, of course, the Utah, um, it was pages and pages of Mormon churches. <laughs> and then I found one. I said, it, it, a Baptist church. I said, that's where we're going. And when we went, it wasn't there. It had shut down. So we're driving along. I said, I guess we're not going to church today. We see a storefront church. So we pull in, and there's, there's only like eight people in it. And two of them are twins, kids. And so we sit in a row right behind them. These two little twins turn around, plop their chin under their seat, and stared at us the whole service. It's like, oh, somebody else at our church. We're scattered everywhere. I went to the Philippines, churches. No matter where you go, churches. There are churches. Let's, God has scattered His people everywhere. We are a scattered people, and no matter where you go in the world, you don't fit into the world's mold. You have to find other Christians to feel at home. That's what it is, that's the way it is. Next, he says, we are selected. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect. God's elect. We think of elections, we think of voting. Well, the only one who cast their vote was God. <laughs> there was no one else voting. God cast the ballot. He voted. He voted. God's elect. That's what he calls his audience that he's writing to. Peter says, you are, a little later, he says, after he names where they're all scattered to, they're strangers, he says, who have been chosen. God, who cast his ballot, chose you. And then he says, according to the foreknowledge of God. A little confusion over this word. Some people equate foreknowledge with foresight, but foresight is not the same as foreknowledge. The Old Testament prophets were called seers. Seers. You know why? They could see the future. God would show them the future, so they had foresight, and we call that 
predictive prophecy, foresight. But they only knew it or could see it because God had determined it and showed it to them. Foreknowledge for an um, all-knowing God, an omniscient God, He knows everything, never learned anything. So to know something in the future is to say that He knows it because it's determined. Who determined it? He determined it. Foreknowledge is just another synonym along with this, elect, chosen, and foreknown, except foreknowledge has a little different twist to it. The word knowledge itself means I can know things, but when it says in Genesis chapter 5 that Adam knew Eve and she conceived and bore a son, you know that the word know didn't mean that they were just acquaintances. (laughs) He knew her and she got pregnant. It's an intimate knowledge. And the idea here seems to be they've been chosen according to this intimate foreknowledge of God having an intimate love for you. So Jeremiah the prophet says it like this, He has loved me with an everlasting love. He's always loved me. He's always loved me. He's made me an object of love. He chose me. God did it. Wow, this is amazing. He says, we were selected by God. We are God's elect. I want to talk about this for a moment. You see, Jesus chose you. Jesus chose you. In John 15, 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me. You did not choose me. Let that sink in for a moment. Sometimes we pat ourselves on the back like, I'm so wonderful, I chose God. And all these heathen out there, all these, they they didn't. But he said, no, 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 you got it wrong. You did not choose me, I chose you. I chose you to open up your eyes so that you would see the glorious truth. I chose you and then I appointed you to go and bear fruit. I, I chose you to to have a purpose that you're going to bear fruit and that that fruit would last. And just a couple verses later, Jesus said, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, as it is. You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. So you see, we are in the world, but we are not of the world because we've been chosen, we've been picked by God, be taken out of the world, set apart as different from the world, so the world does not feel like my home because I've been picked by God to just be a sojourner here and feel out of place. Feel out of place. Lot was a chosen one of the Lord living in godless Sodom and Gomorrah and it said it vexed his soul. We live in America and we see things going on and it should vex our soul. Like Al prayed, we are not happy with what's going on in our country. Who can believe it's degenerated as fast as it has in one generation? It should vex our soul. We are not of the world. We are in it, but we are not of it. We are a different kind of people because God picked us to be different. To be different. You see, you needed divine selection. You needed it. You know why? It's because you are a part of Adam's sinful race. This is probably the most theological verse in the Bible. That's probably debated, but I think it might be. Romans 5.12. Just as sin entered the world through one man. Did you get it? Not one woman, one man. Remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? The woman was deceived. She was tricked. She was beguiled and she partook and she disobeyed God out of deception and being deceived. But the man freely took with his eyes wide open, no deception. He chose sin rather than God. He bit of the apple or the, the fruit of the tree. And once he had partaken of it, he sinned. And the Bible says just as that one man, by the sin of that, that one man, Death came upon all men, okay? And death through sin. 
Had he not eaten of that tree, he would have been able to eat of the tree of life and live forever. But he ate, and the consequences of eating, the the wages of sin is death. So as by one man sin, death came to all men. It says, in this way, death came to all men because, here it is, all sinned. All sinned. When it says all sinned, I'm the all, you're the all, it says, I sinned, you sinned. My original sin happened in the Garden of Eden because I am humanity, and humanity sinned, and humanity died. That's why death is passed on to everyone, because we all sinned in that original sin in the Garden. This is profound theology. You getting your head around that? My original sin was in the garden because I am a human being and humanity sinned in the garden because I'm humanity. I was born a sinner. So were you. I was born in need to be chosen to be saved. It's just that simple. It's that simple. You needed this divine selection because you were spiritually stillborn. Listen, this is what the Bible says. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. That's it. You were dead. Here's the thing about a dead person. They make no choices. They make no choices. They don't choose to get up. They don't choose to go to the bathroom. They don't choose to go to the store. They don't choose to go to work. They're dead. Spiritually, because I was born of Adam's descendants, that sin kept passing on down the line. When I was born, I was born spiritually dead on arrival. I was still born spiritually I needed a quickening and being made alive. And that's what the rest of chapter 2 of Ephesians talks about. By grace are you saved. His grace quickened us, the text will go on to say, for by grace are you saved through faith. You needed the grace of God in order to be saved. You were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live. So you were like a zombie. You were alive physically, but you were dead spiritually. Every time you see a zombie movie, think of that. That's the way I was spiritually. Bodily, I'm alive, but spiritually, I'm dead. You know, I'm just, you you, you see it? You get the picture? I'm trying to paint this for you. You needed divine selection because you could not choose. You could not choose. You see, you were helpless. Totally helpless. What do you mean? Paul, in Romans chapter 3, is quoting from the Psalms, and he says, there is none righteous. Every human being ever born since Adam, with the exception of Christ, who was virgin born to protect him from sin. Are you getting the theology of the Bible? Every single person was born a sinner and therefore not righteous. Not even one. It's emphatic. There is no one who understands you, I, I preach the gospel, I share my faith, and, and, and it's like it just goes right over their heads. They don't understand. No one understands. Listen, no, there's no one who seeks God. I, you have all these churches, they're called seeker churches. No, they're not. Nobody's seeking God. If they were a seeker church, there'd be nobody in it. No, there are churches where you're trying to evangelize the lost. And you're trying to be culturally sensitive to attract a crowd, but they are not seeking. The Bible says. You can see right there, it's in the Bible. No one seeks God. Why? They're dead. Spiritually dead. A spiritually dead person seeks nothing. They've all turned away. They're on the wrong path. They're of the world. And the world, they're the zombie. They're just going down the wrong path. Are you, are you getting the picture? It's a terrible picture. They have together become worthless. Oh my goodness. Without Jesus Christ, we are, according to this passage, worthless. They have together become worthless. There is none that does good. Not even so much as one. You cannot lift a finger to save yourself. So you needed some help from the outside. You needed this divine selection from God. And so Jesus said, you did not choose me. 
I chose you. Don't know about you, but that makes me feel really special. God chose me. Out of all the world, he chose me. And he's appointed me to go and bear fruit. He, he chose me to have a fruitful, spiritual life. Wow, this is powerful stuff. You see, the Bible goes on. I, I want to talk a little bit more about this. You were chosen before time. It says so in Ephesians 1.4. For he chose us in Christ Jesus, in him, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Wow, this is powerful stuff. God chose me before I was ever born. Wait, wait. God chose me before there was ever a creation. Time is part of creation. Without uh, creation, there is no time. You get, get outside of creation, you're into eternity. And God has no time. He's eternal. He chose me before there ever was creation. This is just mind-blowing. It wasn't an accident that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. He chose me to accept Christ as my Savior. I just love this. This is great stuff. We're going to read a little bit further in Peter as we go through this book, but you are a chosen people. He didn't just choose me. There's other people that he has chosen, and we are the body of Christ, and that's why I can go anywhere in the world. There's people that are followers of Jesus because I'm not the only one who is chosen. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of the world, said if God had put X's on the back of, people's, on the back of people who were, supposed, who were the chosen, he said, I would first pull their shirt tail to see if there was an X there before I preached. <laughs> we don't know who the cho chosen are. He does. So we are told to preach to everybody. Because there will be a response to the message because he has those out there that he has chosen, and they will respond. We'll keep going. The chosen people out there. Now, if you start to get feeling like, man, I am really somebody special, boy, is the world lucky to have me? God, you are so blessed. Out of all the people you chose me, I am just such a prize. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and it says, but God chose the foolish things of the world. You know what he's saying? I chose you because you're a fool. You're a fool. Don't get so head smart think you are somebody. In the Old Testament, it says he chose Israel because they were the least of all the nations. You see, God, God seems to cheer for the underdog. You're the underdog. He chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise so that the proud and the arrogant person, he said, you've got to be kidding. God chose them, yes. God chooses us. He chooses the fool. He chooses the weakling, he says, and God chose the weakling, the weak things of the world to shame the wise. You see, it's not that I was godly. The Bible, the Bible is very clear, but God saves the ungodly. It says, for scarcely for a good man some would die, but for an ungodly man is who Jesus died. Oh my goodness. He chose the ungodly, the weak the one who can't save themselves. He chose the weakling. In, in 1 Corinthians, he adds this. He chose the lowly. If you're proud and arrogant, that is the opposite of his divine selection. In order to despise, he said he, he chose the lowly and the despised. The person that you think you despise and think is unsavable, <sighs> that's just the kind of person He's in the business of saving. If you'd been in the early church, you would have despised the guy by the name of Saul. That Saul was breathing out threats to slaughter, incarcerate, and, and to imprison Christians. He was there cheering on the death of the first church martyr, Stephen, and you would have said, we'll have nothing to do with that guy, Saul. You'd be praying, God, kill that man. But God changed Saul into the Apostle Paul because he chooses the lowly and the despised things of this world. I don't know who you think is despised, but God will choose a despised person like that and save them for his glory. 
He says, the things that are not. We just sang that song. I'm just a nobody, right? Telling everybody about the somebody that saved my soul. I fear that most of us don't really live that out. We sing it. But we think we are the somebody telling nobody about Jesus who saved my soul. We need to live out that song, realizing I am just a nobody trying to tell everybody about the one who saved my soul. John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. You see, it's not about me and it's not about you. And if you get your head around that, you'll find purpose in your life that my purpose in life is all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about me. Finally, Paul wraps up this section. He says, so that no one may boast before him. I can never say, wow, you are so good, Dennis. Great job. You're not like this person who doesn't believe. No, I humble myself and I say, but for the grace of God, the most vile, despicable person on planet Earth would be me. Would be me. It is so humbling to realize that he chose me. In Romans chapter 11, he says, so too, at this present time, there is a remnant, a small group of people chosen by grace. And he says, and if it's by grace, then it's no longer of works. It's not anything you've done. He didn't look and see something in you and say, wow, you're going to be a good team player. I'm going to call. I'm going to pick you to put you on my team. He says, no, no, no. If, because if there's something of works in you, then it's no longer grace. Grace would no longer be grace. Grace is absolutely a total gift given to us. And this is the hallmark of the Christian faith. I can do nothing at all to appease the holiness and the outraged anger of God. He freely gives me His pardon, His forgiveness, my salvation as a free gift that I cannot do anything to earn or deserve. I am humble to just say, Thank you, God, for saving my soul. It is so humbling, so humbling. The text in, in the Thessalonian epistle says this, that we ought to always thank God. You hear he's saying, I thank God for you brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved. I didn't choose him. You know, often I'll, I'll you know, say, well, I found the Lord. Well, the truth is the Lord was not lost. <laughs> I was lost, and the Lord found me. The Lord found me. God chose you to be saved. And he's got this, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The word sanctifying means setting apart. That's all the word means. So what, the, what, what, what God did when he saved me is he pulled me out of the world and set me apart. Okay, that was the sanctifying work of the Spirit. I was selected by the Holy Spirit. He regenerated, gave me life. And, and he, he changed my life from the inside out. He says it comes through the belief in the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He set me apart, the Holy Spirit, in belief in the truth, that I would believe the truth and so it goes on and he says this, the setting apart is for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Back in 1 Peter, the very first verse. <laughs> or second verse. We're not getting very far in Peter, are we? Two verses. Here's the second verse. Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit that's doing this work. Peter agrees with Paul and they all mesh together and they teach us about the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. He set me apart. I was a stranger. I was scattered. I was selected. I'm sanctified. Oh my goodness. He goes on and he says, He set us apart for obedience. We are submissive. I am submissive to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm here for obedience to Jesus. The first act of obedience, it seems like always in the Bible, you read through the book of Acts, they believed and then they were baptized. 
Baptism is an act of obedience to the command of Jesus when he said, go and make of disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when a believer says, I believe, they make a public confession of faith by identifying with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection, and they are baptized. It's kind of foreign in the Bible to have a believer who has not been baptized. Because it's an act of obedience. It's kind of like the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a command of the Lord that we remember him by taking of the bread and the cup. We do that in obedience. It's not the only obediences, but there are many more in the Bible. All, all All the imperatives of the Bible. He saved us that we would be, he chose us to be submissive to obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. The sprinkling concept comes from the Old Testament. We are sprinkled by the blood of Christ. And the Old Testament concept was on on the Day of Atonement, the priest would dip his fingers in blood and he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and, and below the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant box Inside of it was the law that the people had broken and the the consequence for breaking the law was death. But they took a substitute's blood and they sprinkled it on the mercy seat to make a covering of their sins and it would go for a year. And it had to be repeated. Covering of sins. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sins. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so here he's he's using the Old Testament metaphor that we were chosen to experience the washing away of our sins by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The final thing that we see here in these first two verses is we are a square peg trying to fit into a round mold and it doesn't work. That round hole, we just don't fit because we are surging in the grace and peace. He says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. The grace and peace didn't end when I accepted Christ. I am graced every day, and I am to experience the peace of God every day. Peace with Him, the peace of Him that passes all understanding. We are surging in all of that. It's like this. You don't fit into the world because you are a stranger, You are scattered, just dwelling in a temporary dwelling. This is not your home. You've been selected by God to be the stranger who is scattered. And you've been set apart by the Holy Spirit to be different from the whole world and that you would be submissive and obedient to Jesus Christ and that you have been sprinkled and bought with the blood of His Son and you are surging in grace that they know nothing about. That's why we don't fit into the world in which we live. God chose us not to fit in, but to fit into his plan and his purpose. So a little bit later in the passage, it's going to say, Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. So how can I be sure that I am the elect? That's a good question. And the answer is very simple. How do you make it sure? In Romans 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord. That's the great confession of the faith. And you believe it in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is with your heart that you believe and are justified. With your mouth, you confess and are saved. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I prayed and I confessed him as my Lord and I believed that he was raised from the dead and and I prayed and asked him to take away my sins and all all, all that that is called the sinner's prayer. I prayed that and and I was saved. But according to Thessalonians, he said, God chose us to be saved and I believed that day and I was saved and so if it's the believers are actually the chosen, then I'm the elect. It's that simple. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, it's because He first chose you. You are the elect. That's the only way I know that you know for sure. Have you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? When you do, you are His elect, His chosen, the select. He says, we, we were chosen to be a square peg, saved, that we, so that we don't fit into the world's round mold. We don't. 
We don't fit in. We're that square peg, and try as you may, you just don't fit in. We don't fit in. We don't fit in. Here's the point. We were chosen to be in the world, but not of the world. He says, you were chosen to be a stranger, just sojourn. <laughs> just sojourn. Pitching your tent for a little while. Because your real home is in heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, sometimes we don't feel like we fit in this world. Sometimes in our social circles. Sometimes at work. Our Lord, just sometimes, just out and about the community. We don't fit in when we watch TV. We just don't fit into those role models that are set there. Lord, everywhere we look, we, we find more and more that we are out of place in this world. And it's rightly so. You have chosen us to be different while in the world, not of the world. May we walk closer to Jesus so that we are more in step with him and less in step with our world. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.